So welcome we're everybody to that. Yes. Uh, top legal mistakes is our, our legal lab. And we'll be doing top legal mistakes. And, um, we have voice law in the house. And um, this is less, you know, uh, presentation, but this is interactive. So, so if you have questions, raise your hand. Uh, and uh, I guess Roger has a couple of slides to go through. Um, as well as the other Steve's partner. And um, let's make it interactive. So if you have questions, you can raise your hand. Um, there'll also be sort of a lot of like if you brought your, your legal documents with you. Sure. We save that for later. <laughs> we've, had, we've had it before. Like, yeah, I, got my, I, got, I got my green in here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, cash and check and, mm -hmm. and, and be set up. So <laughs> accepted. But, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a little casual. I think uh, you have a lot of experience. I've known Roger since I've been here. It's almost 10 years now. And so it's been a. Been a it's interesting to see it actually it's firm grow over the last years and becoming a really boutique firm focused on, on startup startups and the startup economy. Um, but uh, so welcome everybody. A couple of rules for tonight. Um, uh, ba bathroom. So bathroom, if you haven't found it yet, it's actually on the other side of the sink, the wall of the wall. So you can just go around the loop. Uh, gents, gents and ladies are there. Um, if you have to do some conversation or something like that, you can just go to the um, hall or just go over by the ping pong table and get on chat. Um, I think it will be a good hour plus uh, for tonight, for five minutes. Um, and also, if you want to share with your friends, this will be up on YouTube um, within the week, so we can share that with your friends. Um, and then we'll send you a thank you note with the, with the link to you. So that here, which I think is going to be a really good session. Um, some of you already have your questions prepared, which is great. Um, but if you don't, um, think about a little bit of it, like whether it's, you know, tonight's going to be about uh, no versus safe, safe note, <laughs> and going to pitfalls and stuff like that. Um, and it's a how many people first time at Mobile Monday? And everyone, see, it's always like half of you guys. So it, there could be 400 people in the audience, and it was half the audience will raise their hand, which is really funny. Um, so, so I'll just go real quick, my name is Mario Tapia. I've been doing this for fun and passion for 17 years. So in 1999, I started to do a mobile meetup in Seattle. And since then, I've started them in Los Angeles. And now I'm here in New York last summer. So I'll be doing quarterly events in Los Angeles, New York. Um, it's pretty fun. So now uh, my email list is about 30,000 uh, developers, founders, entrepreneurs, and industry folks, which is, which is great. Um, so the agenda, going through the welcome, uh, uh, Roger and the team will come up uh, and do the presentation. A little bit of networking if there's time left, and then we'll lights out uh, when we're done. Um, these are three cities that kind of put events together. So if you guys are traveling, even Chicago, Boston, you um, there's events. There's Philadelphia has an active meetup. Uh, Phoenix, um, London, Berlin, Tel Aviv, Tokyo. So there's quite a few cities out there. Um, about 140 plus to be exact. Um, and all in, some are active and some change, uh, change uh, um, leadership. Um, and then the breakdown is about 30% of everyone is uh, a developer. The other 30 are product and marketing uh, or business development and outwardly focused on a little bit of designers and venture and stuff like that. And then, um, so we have a lot of activity. So this is what we call lab. So it's more of a one-on-one -on -one session, deep dive into questions and answers. We do tech, tech version of this called the Dev Lab, which is more deep dive into APIs, SDKs, et cetera. And then we do panel discussions. So November 7th is uh, coming up. We'll have a, some demos, some, and it's a bot. It's an AI bot uh, themed topic. So we we'll have six AI companies and bots demoing. And then we'll do an ecosystem panel discussion. Basically, most of our panel discussions are ecosystem based. So everyone who's involved in the, in the ecosystem. And then um, we'll also do dinners, round table dinners for um, Fortune 500. Basically, matchmaking for Fortune 500 with early stage startups. Um, and then most of the stuff is we're corporate funded. So this is kind of how we, we can be able to do these cool events. And then more information about us, mobilemoney.us. And then 
Meetup.com. How many people find us on Meetup? How many people find us on Eventbrite? People trolling Eventbrite. I love it. Which is great. It's always good. It's always, I call it organic. Um, but most of the time, I push it out on Meetup. And you'll find us there. Facebook as well. Um, the cool thing, if you follow us on Facebook, um, I always post uh, discounts like the AI conference. I have free expo passes. So just take a look at it and give you some codes. Um, IBM is also having an AI conference. They're going to give you 50% off. So some cool, cool deals. And then last but not least, YouTube. Um, we kind of archive everything there. So we have all our videos. Um, and you always good to have to look back and kind of see what, what the ecosystem looked like <laughs> a few years back. Um, and that's about it. But um, we also have to thank you to our sponsors, Roger and Royce. And we work thanks for having us. Um, uh, so if you guys are tweet tweeting, if you're if you're on if you're on Twitter, um, yeah, at Royce Law and at we work. All right, that's about it. And then I will hand this over to to Roger. You gonna hook my computer up? No, I'll his computer. Up. Okay. Thanks. I'm already tweeting. Um, Hashtag Royce Law with an S, hashtag Mobile Monday, right? Yes. So I'm Roger Royce, I'm the founder of the Royce Law Firm. We're a business corporate and tax firm with offices in Silicon Valley uh, and here in San Francisco, also Los Angeles, downtown, soon to be over in Santa Monica. I'm following Mario's lead and I'm going over to Silicon Beach. Uh, That's right. It, it's, yeah, it's all the cool stuff there. Got a couple of handouts for you in the back. Uh, make sure you grab one of these before you leave. Um, well, they, just in time for Christmas, take a few of them and make great presents. So, I've done this program on legal mistakes for Mobile Mondays twice now. Um, and, and the last two times, and it's a program that I've done a hundred times, and we call it the top legal mistakes that startups make. We're going to mix it up a little bit here tonight. We're going to change the format a little bit and not just focus on all the things that people do wrong. But we're going to kind of walk through, you know, what the process is, the legal process for a startup, what the issues are, what the most frequent questions are, where people tend to get it wrong, uh, what to watch out for. And this is all stuff, you know, even if you're not a lawyer, this is stuff you should know because you need to know the questions to ask your lawyer. And some of the stuff your lawyer might not even think of. You know, if you don't bring it up, if you don't raise it, if you don't ask it. So everybody, you can't just assume that there's a lawyer out there that's going to swoop in and save you someday. You really have to kind of take control of this and, and be in charge. Now, we have for our panel, that's me. Um, we here, pointer. See if it works. That's me. Uh, you'll notice that Ashita is not here tonight. She was six, so we're going to fill in. But Steve Colby is here from Rice Law Firm as well. He's a patent lawyer, and he's going to take a little bit of a deeper dive on patent issues, since I know that's important to you all. So, why don't we get started? And, and, and I like, when I give an overview of a startup, you know, I like to think about it. I like Steve Jobs' rule of threes. And my three is that a startup really needs three things to be successful. Um, whoops, that's not one of them. There we go. People, of course, technology, and then finally money. And all of these things require really good legal bones. And I like to break it down into those three categories. So starting with the people side of this, you need an entity because you need an organization that those people can be a part of, right? You, you need an entity for two big reasons. One is to start collecting the intellectual property that you're going to start creating. The second reason is to find a way to compensate and reward all of your stakeholders. That's your founders, that's your advisors, service providers, and importantly, investors. So question number one, choice of entity. And let's just start right there. Uh, everybody knows that the Delaware C Corporation is what all startups, well, startups use, right? Well, not necessarily. That is the default. That's where everybody goes. But frankly, I think the issue should require a little bit more thought than that. So I always like to take a big step back and walk through what the differences are. And in fact, I have an entire hour on choice of entity, that I, the, the presentation that I give to, to tax lawyers. 
because it is a much more complex decision than you might think. Now, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. You just kind of have to know really a couple of big issues, big differences. Okay, LLC, limited liability company. Um, it's uh, very flexible and it's very tax favorable in some respects. It's one level of tax. All the income of the LLC passes through and is taxed to the owners. Uh, unlike a C corporation, where the income is taxed to the C corporation, and then when it's distributed out, it's taxed to the owners. So it's taxed twice. The S corporation, if you meet the requirements, has that one low level of tax also. So that's sort of the basic difference. Now, why is this important? Because you're a startup, you don't have any income anyway, right? You're not going to pay tax. Why do you care? But at some point, you're going to get to this. I want to focus on one big thing, even though there's a million little things, but there's one big thing. When you get to your exit, and by the way, you should be thinking about your exit, you know, the day you form your company. When you get to the exit, your buyer may or may not want to buy assets. Okay? Now, I have to fuzz it up a bit because I always tell people that every buyer wants to buy assets. But you know, I'm doing a deal this week with, with I'll just tell you this, with Dow. And they're a very, very big buyer. And they came along and they said, we want assets. And we said, well, that's going to give us a bad tax result. And I said, OK, who, who cares? We'll take stock. What the hell? That doesn't happen very often. You know, usually that's going to cost you. Because buyers, if they get stock, they get a non-depreciable asset. They can't amortize the stock. If they buy assets, they can amortize it. There's a tax reason for them wanting assets. So usually, that's what you're going to have. So if you're a C Corp and if you sell assets, now you've got a big gain. Pay C Corp tax, and you distribute what's left over to the shareholders. You pay shareholder tax. You know you're at about 60% federal tax. Okay, 35% C Corp level, then another 20%. You know, plus the Obamacare 3.8%. Plus if you're in California, another 9.3% here. So it really adds up. Plus the state level taxes. You you might end up with 30 cents on the dollar. Okay, it's not a very good result. So having heard that, you might say, well, that's a no-brainer. We're going to do LLCs and S-Corps from now on. But there's a downside, because a C-Corp can do something that none of these other entities can do. It can issue this thing we call qualified small business stock. And investors will often want that. And what that is, is if they hold qualified small business stock, and that's pretty much any stock in a small corporation um, that's in an active business. They hold that stock for five years and they sell it. They don't pay any gain at the federal level. So that's a real benefit. So you got this tension. You know, do I do a C Corp because the investor's going to want that? Do I do an S Corp because I might not have investors? And that's the problem I have. You know, everybody comes in and they say, well, we're going to go get you know, our seat round and we're going to get VC funding and then we're going to go public or we're going to exit for $100 million. And you know all this stuff is not going to matter. We have to be a C corp at the end anyway, because the VC, the VCs always want you to be a C corp. That's what everybody thinks is going to happen. I'm going to show you some statistics a little later to tell you that that's not what often happens. What happens instead is if you're successful, you do maybe a death financing, and then you get to about 30 million of value, and then you exit. And you never, and then you pay your double tax because your C corp as you thought you were going to be huge. So I always, so about half the lawyers you talk to will say, be a pass through. That's what I say, as a tax lawyer, just from having seen enough of this. But the other half of lawyers you talk to, including tax lawyers, will say, no, be a C corp so you can offer this qualified small business stock. The moral of the story here is that it requires a little thought. So don't just you know default into it. And again, I've got an entire hour on this topic, all the different things, but that's the one big thing. Um, I want to get into the people side of this now. Let's assume you've chosen your type of entity, C4, S4, LLC, whatever it is. Uh, the very first thing, how many of you, you're all startup entrepreneurs, right? How many of you have co-founders? Most of you. So very early, and I talked to a company today that's been around for five years and they still haven't issued any stock. Four co-founders. That's, that's, uh, that's a disaster when it happen. So one of the first things you want to do, why you want to incorporate early, and issue, is so you can divide up the ownership. You want to do a real, you know, you want to do that as soon as possible to avoid that dispute. Because this is one of those dead on arrival type issues. 
By the way, I've got a book that's called Dead on Arrival, <laughs> How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Can Kill Your Startup. And they dead on arrival issues if the founders are fighting over equity, because nobody's going to want to invest in a lawsuit. So divide it up equally. OK, let's say we all agree that we're going to do that. So you come into my office and you sit down, and you say, we're here to divide up our stock. And I say, great. I say, how do you want to divide it? And uh, one of you says, I think it should be 60-40. And your partner says, you know, I think it should be 60-40 too. But you know what? You're not thinking the same thing. So you ask me. You say, what should I do? How should I divide this company up? And I could say, well, how should I? I'm just a lawyer. You know, I'm just going to document it. Or I could tell you some of the methods that people use. Equal percentages is most common. Gee, three founders, that's one third each. It's also the most inefficient. Okay, in fact, statistically, there's studies out there that show that companies that use this equal method tend to have lower valuations and financing. Um, there's what I call subjective. That's the fist pounding method. Right? You sit down and negotiate it. Whoever can pound their fist the hardest on the table gets the most equity. That's also not very fair. Better than equal, not very fair. There's a formula. You come up with some formula that you agree on. Look, my opportunity cost is worth twice as much as yours, so I should get twice as much stock as you. Okay, and we just apply this formula. And that leads us to this last one, dynamic split. And it's something that I've been using more and more. It's also called slicing pie. All right, dynamic split or slicing pie method. Or the grunt fund method. It's also called that. And this is a system where we basically um, add up I used to have a chart here that showed you how we do it. But you can go online and go to sliceandpie.com. Uh, you basically keep track of everybody's contribution to the company on a rolling basis as you go forward. You keep track of cash, you keep track of the value of the services, the IP, the facilities, the supplies, the relationships. You just have a formula and you keep track. And you just, at any given time, you don't want to know your relative percentage ownership. You just look at your spreadsheet and everybody's keeping track of their inputs. So you just enter your data. And then at some point, usually when you get your first financing, you just stop and take a picture, uh, figure out what your relative inputs are worth at that point, and then start investing from that point. That's the slicing pie method. It's gaining a lot of popularity. I'm getting a lot of calls about that. It was uh, introduced by a guy named Mike Boyer in Chicago, and I'm seeing it more and more. And we can make that work. It's a little bit tedious. You know, you got to enter the information, just like us lawyers do every day. Uh, but it's a really good, fair, objective system. All right. I want to talk about a couple of things. Everybody knows what investing is, right? So, big legal mistake number one I already hit. That's where people just don't get around to deciding what their percentage is. You know, they kind of know, or maybe they have a verbal agreement, they don't put it in writing. The second issue, I would say, is having investing on those shares. Now, vesting is the idea that you burn into the stock through continued service. And if you leave the company, you have to give some or all of your shares back to the company. And with the startup, that's really important because the company is going to need your founder shares back in order to issue those to somebody else. Okay, so every company ought to have vesting restrictions if you have more than one founder. Because if something happens and somebody leaves, uh, the company needs those shares back. And that happens. Once you get beyond two founders, it's, uh, your odds go up exponentially of having somebody leave or get kicked out and having to give the stock back. Now, after I explain this to you the first time, you're going to say, well, OK, I'll invest my shares. But if you sell the company, I should be fully vested. What if you sell it a year? What if my shares vest over three years? So I earn them by working for you for three years. Um, I want to accelerate. The second thing is, what if you guys kick me out for no reason? I think I should accelerate and get all my shares at that point. So they call that a single trigger. We never do that anymore. Here, here, and I'll just tell you, we just cut to the chase. You know, the market is really efficient now. And where we always end up, and what you can get away with with investors, is what we call a double trigger. And the way it works is like this. If, and the concept is, if, if, if the company gets acquired before I, the founder, are fully invested, and because of that, I become redundant, and then I get kicked out of the company just for that reason. Well, OK, I should get my full percentage. I should fully invest. Uh, if, on the other hand, 
If it doesn't work exactly like that, then I don't only vest. I just vest in whatever I have at the time I terminate service. So a double trigger means that I'll get full or partial vesting, and additional vesting, all of my shares will vest, if I'm terminated without cause within six months or sometimes a year of a sale of the company, okay? That's a double trigger. The idea is we're gonna protect you from a really bad scenario where we kick you out just because we sold the company. Okay, that's what you end up seeing. Um, just so you know, if you have anything other than that, you might wanna just stop and think about it because somebody's gonna have to renegotiate in some way. That's founders. There's a couple other classes of stakeholders I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, one is, so founders, remember people, really important. Founders are important. The first thing you're going to do after you form a company, your founders are going to go out and find a really good group of advisors. Not directors, but advisors. Now, what's an advisor? This is somebody who has some particularized knowledge, and you need them just to help advise the company. Maybe they help you find financiers. Um, maybe they know the industry really well, and they help you with connections to companies, whatever it is, so you give them equity. Uh, how much equity should you give them? That is the FAST model. It was developed by Adeo Rossi uh, down at the Founders Institute down in Sunnyvale, and it's become, I think it's a really good model. Uh, you can look it up online. It's something I use regularly. It's a little grid. How far along is the company? What do you want this person to do? Uh, how much time are they going to commit to the company? You go through the grid and you come up with a number between one fourth and one percent. Sometimes up to two if it's a really, you know, really important person. Uh, that's the amount of equity. But this next point is where people sometimes miss the mark. Milestones and deliverables. Your advisors. They're not like rank and file. They're not founders. They don't come to work every day. How do you know when they're performing? can't just use time-based vesting like we would with a founder. It can't be, gee, if you work for three years, you get fully invested. You really got to have some milestones, because as often as, uh, oftentimes, advisors end up talking a big game but not, not performing at all. Now we've got their stock, what are you going to do? So, so a couple of things that are different about advisors, I want to mention. Milestones. If you want to invest in your shares, you've got to hit these milestones. And you got to bring me these deliverables. You got to get me these many customers. You got to introduce me to this many VCs or, or whatever it is. You know, if you want your shares and deliverables, you got to give me this at these times, and then you'll invest. If you don't, you don't invest. How long do you think advisors should invest? But let me ask you something. How long do you think founders should invest? Who thinks it's three years? I think it's three years. Founders three years. Everybody else four years. Sometimes five. Advisors are usually about two years, you know, because their service should not be required for longer than that. They're, the, they're, you know, they're providing some very specific thing. Now, here's the other difference between advisors and everybody else. Everything I've just said about double triggers, it's hard to make that case with an advisor, because if you can acquire the, the, the acquiring company, they don't want your advisor. They don't care. They don't need someone to introduce their company to investors. They are going to be gone, 100% sure they're going to be gone. So oftentimes with advisor agreements, you'll see this accelerated vesting on acquisition uh, just because they got you there, uh, they got you to that point, they helped out. But you won't have this double trigger stuff with advisors typically. It doesn't really make sense. And then finally, what are you going to give the advisor? Right? If you're a cash star startup, um, typically, Stock or options, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. Let me go do it right now. So does everyone know what an option is? Right? It's a right to acquire stock at a certain price. Um, the other thing that we see in startups is restricted stock. Now, third big mistake companies make is everybody knows what options are, so they run off and they grant options. And everybody now, everybody now knows, because it's been since 2005, that you have to have a valuation. There's a tax rule, 409A, that requires a valuation for stock options. So everybody knows that. So, but I've seen this happen over and over. You're a young startup, you just started, you got no revenue, you got an idea, you got a concept, you got some people. So you grant the option and you go to the valuation firm and you say, 
can you tell me the company for me for our purposes? And they say, no, we can't, you're too early. There's nothing of value. So why don't you just pick a number and you know we'll just come back and revisit it later? Well, that's not a problem until it's a problem. And it's a problem when you have a company like we often have in the valley that goes from zero to hero, you know, in a short period of time, when you have a tremendous amount of explosive growth. And I've had this happen about once a year, this happens, where I have some company that applied this philosophy and did not get the valuation, uh, but they're worth $100 million within a year, and a buyer says, we don't believe it. We don't believe your pricing. You know, it had to have been worth more than that. Look how valuable you are now. You went from a penny to a dollar in a year, you know, and, and what the buyer does in that case is they make you, the seller, go back and cancel all those options before the IRS finds out about it. And by the way, the IRS, I've only seen one IRS on it since 409A on this issue. Uh, the, the tax authorities haven't really caught up to this yet, and unfortunately, that's got people to be really bold, but, but the buyers really understand this issue. So it's a due diligence issue more than anything. So what are we going to do? Are you going to go spend $5,000 and, and get the valuation? It's a lot less now with these shares, but still you're going to spend the money. Another approach is to just grant stock. You don't need a valuation if you're just granting stock to service providers. All right? It's not a great practice because now you've got a bunch of unaccredited investors probably on your cap table and you may have to deal with them down the road when your acquirer comes along, but it's better than granting options with no valuation. And it's a lot cheaper, so you don't have to pay for it. So what I like to do, what I think is the better practice, is to provide a promise to grant options. Say, look, we don't have a valuation yet. The offer letter says, we're gonna give you, you know, options on 10,000 shares of stock as soon as we adopt a stock option at the valuation established in that plan. Um, it's not the greatest deal for the optionee because he's helping the value go up and up and up, you know, at, at which he's going to eventually get his option. And that's his exercise price. But it solves all of these problems we mentioned. Another alternative are these phantom units. We do this periodically, more and more now. I've been doing it for 20 years. I do a lot more now. And that's just a bonus plan. It's just, look, we're going to just grant to you this right to a bonus that's equal to this many shares of stock if we had granted the stock. It's phantom stock. We avoid all these issues and others, but it's a little harder sell. A little harder sell because, like Miranda writes, everybody thinks they know what an option is. They know they should have one. Phantom units, that's a story, right? Hey Roger? Yes. Question on, because I advise a lot. Yep. Um, best team time. Do you think now is like, so I've been in the middle of a company that I hadn't, I hadn't really got, got into the, um, the the days of basically my 12 months or 24 months of service as an advisor, and they get acquired. Yeah. So I invested, and so then I get a letter saying I'm not so well. That's right. Unless you negotiated for a change of control provision in your documents. And the point I'm making is I used to push back real hard on that until I thought about it one day. Or <laughs> somebody, you know, reminded me that I'm an advisor. You know, there's no way I'm sticking around after a change of control. So it's not really fair. If I help you sell this company, then I lose my shares because of it. Could, could you, and so now I, I'm asking for um, a monthly investing. So basically it's a 12 month, maybe 12, 18 months. And so every month, Best. That's a good compromise, and if it's only 12 or 18 months, then you know you're going to be, you know, you can feel a little safer because you're going to be mostly vested. Right? But, that, but that's not, not a radical idea. Not at all. I mean, I've seen one year vesting for advisors. It kind of depends on the advisor. And I'm always on the company side, so I always push for two years. But, you know, 12 or 18 months is certainly reasonable. Yeah, let's, by the way, let's make this interactive. I probably should have said that. Yeah, so. there's one question. You mentioned that there is some form of promissory note type thing that it will issue uh, options when we have a valuation yeah. Is there yeah. a name for that? Well, uh, no. Uh, it's just an offer letter. It's just, you would just put that in your offer letter. 
that we're going to recommend to the board, and you're going to grant some fuzzy you know, lawyer language. We're going to recommend to the board that we grant you an option for 10,000 shares. That's a shot. So that would be a best option. But yeah, we just defer the decision to taking an option plan. Okay. And it defers all the cost and expense as well. And we've talked about valuations. You know, the other issue that I want to mention is this we mentioned 409A. That's the rule that requires valuations. Uh, the other thing that, so this rule, what it actually does, um, by the way, I lunch today with the accountant who claims to be the reason for the rule. He took credit for this. It's because of all of these abusive structures he put in place when he was at the unnamed Big Four accounting firm for years and years. Is what got the IRS to come and reward him by changing the law. I don't know if I believe that or not, but uh, the other thing 409A does, it says that if you have, if somebody works in one year and they get paid for that work in a later year, that's deferred compensation. And that has to meet all these very specific requirements that we oftentimes cannot meet. Uh, and if it doesn't, then there's a penalty tax. In state and federal, it could be between 80 and 100 percent. It's a big, big number. So, so if I'm a founder, and I, maybe my wife is working, so I, she, she's supporting the household. And then I supposedly defer my salary payment until I actually get some money to start up. Um, so that's the scenario. That's exactly the scenario. That's exactly what everybody says. They're thinking, God, I'm working so hard, you know, and I'm not getting any pay. I think I'm just going to make a little entry on the books of the company here and just, you know, just keep it accrual my compensation. If that's all you're doing, that's creating a real problem for you. So, first of all, good luck with that. Let's see if the investor, you know, actually pays you when you get funded. Uh, but every once, in a, but even if they don't, if you created a legal obligation of that company because maybe you had a board resolution to pay you this deferred comp at some point in the future, an undetermined point, well, you've got a foreign A violation. Violation. Okay, you've created a problem. Now, there is a way to do this right. So I keep telling this to people, and every, somebody in the audience says, wait a minute, I did that, and it worked just fine. There's a way to do this right. Um, if the deal is that, here, there's three ways. One is that if the deal is, uh, we're just going to comply with 4 and we're going to have a plan. It's going to be in writing. It says, I get this money on this date out in the future. Fine. If it says, Hey, we're you know I get this money within uh, by March 15th within within two and a half months after the end of the year that I perform the services. Fine, that works as well. If it says I get this money when we get funded, that's a little ambiguous. If that means you don't get the money if you don't get funded within a certain amount of time, then I think that's okay. But if it means Ten years from now, when you get funded, you get the money, then I'm not so sure that's okay, right? I'm not sure that complies. So it requires you to be a little bit careful, okay? I've seen companies get in trouble with this. We can always fix it, but, um, you know, 4-9-A, just keep, yes, sir, keep in mind. So, so if you have a, a statement that says, I'm going to get paid in March, and then it comes March and you don't have any money, can you just, like, do another one that says, I'm going to get paid in September? Well, okay, so the rule that now we're getting kind of deep in the weeds, but you can't have a substitution payment. The IRS thought of that. And if that substitution payment itself would be a foreign IA valuation. So what it means is that now the company owes you the money and they better pay, and if, they, and if there's a hardship reason they just can't, that's not going to create a penalty for you. Uh, but, if you try to, but if you try to replace it with a substitute payment, then you may have a problem. So you better be, you better be pretty sure you're going to get funded by that. Okay, we talked about investing. How are we doing on time? Oh, geez, halfway through. 83B, we all know about 83B elections, right? You gotta file these when you get invested stock, otherwise you get taxed when the stock invests at a high value. It's really important. It has to be done within 30 days of getting the invested stock. Not the options, not the stock, but the invested stock. Um, the tax rule is that invested stock is treated as not issued until it invests. That's a bad rule because if it vests when it's worth $100 million instead of when it's worth $1 million, that means you've got $100 million of income because you only pay a million for it. The real number is it's $1,000 and $10 million, which 
get the idea. Here's the thing about 83 the elections. Another big mistake is that a lot of companies, um, uh, our policy at our law firm is that we want to take care of this for you, okay? I want to go do this myself. All I want you to do is just have all your people sign it and give it back to me, and I'll make sure it gets filed, and I get a file stamp copy from the IRS. Um, in fact, every once in a while somebody says, oh, well, I can do that, I'll just go file it myself. I say, please don't do that, you know, please don't do that, because if you don't get a copy, if you can't prove you file it, if you forget, if you file it one day late, you know, you create a big problem for yourself, and for me, because I'm going to be I'm going to spend all this money rewriting the documents, trying to fix it, scrambling, sending a request to the service. Just let me do it. Other law firms don't take that approach. Other law firms say, we're not going to file any of them because we might make a mistake. We might file a day late or forget a signature or somehow mess up the election or you didn't give us the right information. So it's all on you. They make you sign a document that says it's all on me. I don't like doing that because it's a pretty rare company that can get this right. You know, there's always something. It's so simple, but people will be like a day late, or they won't keep a copy, or they won't get a file stamp copy, or they won't send it certified. There's always something, and it costs a lot of money to fix this mistake. So this is one where I'll even do it for free if I have to, just because I know it's gonna cost a lot of money on the back end if, I, if we don't get it done right, 83B. Again, let's make this interactive. Yes, sir. On the 83B, so um, uh, I had I had this happen to me. I was part of a company startup. I filed my 83B, got the uh, certified copy back from the IRS. Then the company is gone now. What do I do? I mean, that's still there in the IRS as as something that was filed. Do I need to file something else or? What happens? Now, the rule used to be you, you're required to attach a copy to your income tax return and send it in. You don't even have to do that anymore. Um, you get a deduction now if the company's gone out of business. It's a capital loss deduction, so it's not worth much uh, for, the, for whatever the cost is of that stock that you bought. But there's nothing you have to do other than that. Um, so quickly, and then we're going to get into the IP issues. Hold on a second. So, he bought the stock, right? Yeah. So he's going to get a capital loss because the company's gone. Yeah. And the IRS is going to know this. Well, he's going to report it. He's going to put that right down on his tax return. When the company goes out of business, right? Yeah, when the stock is worthless. Right. Uh, a couple of quick issues. These are big problems for startups. Employee versus independent contractor. We could spend a lot of time on this. Uh, misclassification is a huge issue. Uh, it can tank a company. We have a whole webinar on this that we just did last week. It's called Employment Law in the Gig Economy. Um, you can find it on our on RoyceUniversity.com. Uh, but and you know the scenario. You know you don't want to withhold wages. You don't want to pay payroll taxes. So you just pay people as contractors. And if they are contractors, that's great. You know, good luck. If they're more properly classified by the IRS's employees, um, you know, the company is responsible for the employee's taxes in that case, which you did not withhold. So it's a big problem. Yes, sir. How, how important is it to have like a custom contractor uh, contract saying that this is pretty much is pretty much the uh, The contract it, it's well. The contract is only one piece of this puzzle. So let me tell you something about those documents that you found online that you want to use for this. The ones that have brackets that say company name here. <laughs> um, I've seen that, people sign that. Uh, it, it, uh, it's only one piece of the puzzle. The person really does, and it's a matter of control. And if you really do have control, the right of control and direction over the person or an employee, and that's a lot of factors. That's facilities, I mean, whose place are they using? Are they required to account hourly? Do they have to come certain hours? There's 20 some different factors you have to look at to determine who directs and control. So the contract is only one, it's a pretty minor piece of that puzzle. Uh, the other issue I wanna mention, it's not tax at all, is if you wanna use those sort of, those documents, we're gonna get to it. You need it, we're gonna get to the IP section. You need an invention assignment. It's got to be the right kind of assignment. You want the right language in the document. So I'd be a little careful about that because that's a big, big issue. 
for both employees and, and uh, contractors, you, know, you need an IP uh, silent. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you want that. I mean, there, under employment law, you probably have rights to the IP for an employee. But I still want to see the assignment because the employee might have had stuff that they're carving out. Uh, there might be some ambiguity about what's. We're going to get to that in a minute here. I just want to pause on that. Employee versus independent contractor. A lot of startups mess this up, and it can it can break down a company. It's a huge liability. It regularly home joint. You know, remember them? Ten million dollars of venture out of business because of a misclassification issue. Wage and hour laws. I have yet to meet the company that can comply with California's wage and hour laws. It's almost impossible. You know, they're so Byzantine. Um, but we try our best. That's the startup plan. And where startups have to watch out um, is the big issue is the, 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 the temptation is almost irresistible to give stock to everybody as compensation. Resist that urge, okay? You can get away with that with founders. But for people who are not founders, you know, they are entitled to be paid currently, you know, and in cash, not stock, and not at some point in the future. And that's a violation of our federal and state wage and hour laws if you don't do that. So I know, kind of, I tell that to everybody, and hardly anybody does it. All right, let's talk about IP a little bit. You want to jump ahead to your slide? Uh, no, I mean, let's, let's sit here and I'll, I'll talk about IP a little bit and then some issues and then value. And, sorry, go ahead. Who a pointer? Right. Okay. So, because um, Roger said I'm a patent attorney, which means I don't have to deal with a lot of the things that you just heard about, but all my clients do. And so I see a lot of the situations where clients, or firms have made these types of mistakes and end up crashing and burning because of three months of paying somebody in equity and a year later it kills a, a company that could be worth millions of dollars. And so these types of little mistakes make a real big difference. My specialty though is building assets and values for the company. So when I meet with a client for the first time, I like to ask them all kinds of questions about what they plan to do in the company, what their goal is, and where they want to be in five or 10 years. And the reason is because I spent a decade in industry as a product manager, and I'm a product builder. That's what I used to do for a living. And then I started doing a lot of patents and inventions, and eventually I passed over to the other side, you know, call it, but I passed over to the other side. And uh, I bought a tie. Yeah. And now, when I go to and meet inventors or I meet a, a startup team, the first thing I ask them is a lot of these questions that Roger just brought up. I, say, I, I go through a checklist. You know, do you have a founders agreement? Uh, that's an agreement between the founders that talks about things like the equity and if somebody leaves or somebody passes away and, and things like that. Because there are so many clients I see that don't have that in place. And one of the things I want to see in the, in the Founders Agreement is an IP provision, not just for the employees or for uh, contractors or advisors. There has to be a provision within the uh, Founders Agreement that the founders are going to sign an IP to the company. Right? So if one founder has an idea and, and leaves six months later and the assignment's not there, then the company can be in serious trouble because that person may own a piece of patent. When I talk about owning a piece of a patent or a patent application, in the United States, the original owners of a patent application are the inventors. Okay? And there's a lot of rules about who is an inventor. It, it has to be somebody who actually contributed to conceiving the ideas. Not the engineer who wrote the code, or the person who built the bridge, but the person who had the ideas, or who conceived of them. And those people have to all be listed as inventors. You can't exclude people. Even if somebody added only a small part to them, to the main idea, they're still counted as an equal inventor. So they own a piece of the patent application on the day that it's filed. And that's why you need to have an assignment that's been blessed by an attorney, probably a patent attorney, that assigns that patent and any daughter patents or any related inventions to the company right away. And that needs to be in place because it's surprising how reluctant employees can be to sign documents after they've left the company and somebody realizes, oh, they never signed this document. And that includes founders, right? So you, your investors, you know, in your, in your professional rounds of financing 
are going to go to everybody and, and, and look at the IP and make sure that every inventor has actually signed something. And that might include a patent. So, as I said, my purpose is, is to create value. Why, do you, why would a startup want to spend a lot of money on patents? Patents are pretty expensive. I have done statistics on my own practice, and getting a patent application on file, the first one is about a $15,000 project. After a few, you're probably twelve to 9000 depending on the type of technology and how close your patent applications are related. But you know, once you're up to 20, it's, it's, it's generally around 10000 a piece just to get them on file. So the question is, why do you want to do that? You're a startup. Right? Well, most people answer, I didn't get an answer from you guys, oh, we're going to have a monopoly. We're going to be able to pound everybody else's head because we have this patent. Right? Well, the patent application is going to issue five or 10 years down the line after it's filed, maybe. And to, to assert a patent, it's a one or two million dollar project in, in legal fees and expenses. All right? So the chances are that five years later, your startup is either going to be already exited, or you're probably not going to have a $2 million budget to go into certain patents. So really, realistically, the reason that you're going to be fine for patent applications isn't because you want to bang all your neighbors. What you want to do is create value for the company. All right? And there's two stages that we focus on with value. The first is, as you're doing funding rounds, right? your investors are going to come along and you're going to explain to them that you have patent applications. For many investors, if, if, if in many pitches I've seen, this is just one slide saying, here's our six patent applications, and somebody does a checkbox, okay? That might create a little value. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how you can make that, that better. The second time the, the patents can contribute is at the exit, right? Very often, there'll be half a dozen companies in your space, and two or three big companies looking to, to buy assets in that area. And one of the things they're really serious to consider is what does the IP portfolio look, look like? And that's the point where I hope uh, that, that my work is actually paid for itself. I like to go to, to clients and say, um, my goal is that all the money you spend on me is going to pay back tenfold. Now, I can't tell you that that actually happens, but that's kind of where my mindset comes from, is that I want to write patent applications that match your know, portfolio. So the first thing, of course, as I just told you, is make sure you really own patent applications. Okay? To talk, of, I will ask you about, did you work for Adobe two years ago, and does the product you're making look exactly like the product you've worked on Adobe? These are the things that sometimes people say yes to. So um, let's talk a little bit about how to make a valuable patent portfolio. So I, my background is, is product development and marketing. Right, so I did a lot of trade shows, and I would sell products to people at, 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 in their offices or on a trade show or on the website or something. And so my background is I want to sell things. And when I talk to people for the first time about their patent portfolio, I don't ask what the engineers think is cool. I ask what the salespeople think is cool. Because the patent should be something that your sales and marketing people are really excited about. They want to go to their, their prospect and say, we're the only people who have this, this, this thing here, and that's why you want to buy our product, okay? There needs to be a connection between the silver bullets that sell your product and what's in the patent application. And very often I see a situation where that's just not true. What's in the patent applications are what the engineers thought were really cool, but not the things that really sell a product. Sometimes I'll, be, I'll meet with the founder team and I'll say to them, so why are people going to buy your product? Tell me what the three most important things are. Rule of three, right? And I'll get three different answers. And so then I'll, my next question will be, okay, you guys need to coordinate that because, <laughs> because that's an issue. You need to know why your product is going to sell. And so what we do is we look at those things that are going to make the product sell. And then we take a step back and we say, what are the technologies that we've developed that, will, that enable these features? And that's how we sit down and identify which things to buy patent applications on. Now, in a, you know, in a detailed hour-long strategy meeting, we'll drill down on all these possible inventions that have, the list that we've come up with, and we'll talk about which one of them really add value to the selling of your products, okay? Sometimes we'll talk about what will really add value to the selling of the products of your acquirer, right? So you might have a medical device company, you hope to be bought by Medtronic, We'll write patent applications on your technology in their device, okay? Because we are thinking that in five years, they may own you, and we want to create a valuable patent for that, 
Right? So if you develop your patent strategy at, on, on this tactic, what happens is you end up with a portfolio that you can point to as actually connecting to the value of your company, not just a checklist on the wall or a checklist on board saying, "Here's our six patent applications." You can do a pitch, or you can do a presentation to investors saying, here's why we're going to be number one, and here's why you should give us $10 million. I've told you these reasons, and then this is exactly the types of things that we've filed patent applications on. And sometimes I do clients, I do, I'm going to use the, uh, yeah. my slide here. I have one slide. You don't know where Rogers got it. Oh, it's up there, keep going. Okay, I'm just going to click until you get one that looks like. So, maybe. Again, this is a cluster map. Okay, have you ever seen one of these in an investor recognition? Okay, so this is done, uh, this is fictitious, I think mostly, <laughs> um, on the Polycom speakerphone. It's like shaped like a triangle. All right, you all know those. I, I use this as an example because half the time there's one of these phones in the conference room where I discuss it. So the things that make that product so good are the really big sound that it gets. And you can hear it really well. Um, you've got good reception because it's got a series of microphones around the outer edge and kind of, it, they're in a circle, even though it's a tri triangular shaped phone. And you can, it was duplex, so you could speak and talk and speak. Okay, so imagine you're pitching this phone to investors and you've just told them that these are the magic keys to the kingdom. This is why your product's gonna be so good. And then you show them this instead of a list of patent applications you sell. This is how all the IP that we've got now protects the things that I've just told you are the, are the value of our company. So if you do your patent application, right, you keep this in mind, just in the back of your head, as you're doing, deciding what to spend your patent budget on, you can get to the point where you actually create value. And my goal, again, is to make sure that the value of the, what you spend on IP gets paid for right every time you factor it around. And this, uh, clients love this. Uh, they, they'll, they'll, you know, every year or so, or every two years, they'll say, can you do another custom app for me? Can you do another custom app for me? Because, because the investors like it. And, and there are plenty of investors who haven't seen maps, uh, diagrams like this, and they'll all of a sudden look up and, and realize that they're looking at something different they haven't seen before. So this is a nice slide, but it's also the result of thinking through the process to get to here from the very beginning. Uh, any questions? That's that's my patent portfolio strategy. Okay. Yes. I'll ask. I, I, I'll be happy to answer specific questions about IP too. I, I guess uh, uh, I'm a business guy. Yeah. And for me, like, what's patentable doesn't come to me naturally. So how do we even think about, for example, like determining if worth bringing it up? Should I even use this to be yeah. patentable? So, think, so, you know, so yeah. this this is. Um, yeah, you're doing the technology forward approach. I want to do the sales backward approach. I want you to bring to me the three things, the, the few things that really are going to sell your product. And then we'll have a discussion about is there technology that's enabled those and how, how to approach the path. And there are times when there's nothing. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a marketing strategy and, you know, People walk down the street with clipboards or something. You know. So it, there are times when we'll, I'll back off right away if there's nothing that, that's patentable. And, and that happens often. But I, I do work with companies that make ice cream. Okay? There are things that, that are key to making their product really good that have to do with the design of their equipment. And that worked. It was, it was patentable stuff. I've done dog collars. And we litigated dog collars. Yeah. So the idea here is that um, you're saying to them, look at what do we want? We want the future is big sound, full duplex, good reception, and then what is the indicia to get us there? Obviously, a motherboard is unique. Triangular shape might help percep reception. Yeah. Uh, microphone locations might be a patent issue. So let's go the other way. Now we've done this, and we find out that you know Oracle owns all these patents already because they. You know, just file patents. So, so, the, so, how do you how do you get around that? Okay. So, let me talk a little bit about uh, prior art patents or other people's patents. Right. There are two very distinct camps on on this issue. The first is uh, 
we don't want to know anything about what's out there because once you know about it, it creates an amount of liability. And I have friends who work in house at larger corporations, and the last thing they ever want is an email and a patent. I mean, I, I, some of them must have filters that just kill that, right? Because they don't want to know anything, all right? And that's kind of what I, and they have a good reason for that because if they see something and somebody can prove that they saw it, they are liable for infringement from the day they see that patent. Now, if you're a startup with three people, okay, and you're coming up with a design of something or you're six months into your project, and you realize that Oracle owns a key patent on what you want to do, you're, you're, you should be happy that you're not three years into it, okay? So for startups, and me as an engineer and scientist, um, I like to know what's in the literature. I you know, read journals, okay? And I, I don't read patents unless I can help it, but, but you know, I read journals all the time, and I look at what's in the technology space just so I get an idea of what's going on in the fields that I work a lot in. And so I tell startup companies that they should treat patents like any other source about knowing what the competition is doing. And they should go out there and look at, around and get an idea of what's there. People ask me about doing patent searches. Sometimes we do it because it's relatively expensive and helps us a little bit. Uh, but I tell people, you know, your key people should know, you know, what's an ACM journal on this subject or what's the IEEE journal on this subject. And you should know what your competition is, is doing. Because when you're a startup, you're agile. You can change then or you can walk away and do something else. But once you're a 40, 50, or 100 million dollar company, now it becomes a real issue, right? We didn't know about this. We've got a product that we worked on for three years, and we're going to try to get a license. So, so it's when you start off, it's good to know everything that's out there. Once you're a well-established company, you kind of want to put a little bit of blinders on it. In this case, when you were giving an example, maybe they're not doing anything. Maybe you can get a license. Um, certainly, you have options at that stage that you don't have three years ago. So you're saying get a license for them to use their patent, basically? I would say, well, it depends on the situation. And my first choice is, would be to engineer around. Right. You know, so so that's that's the goal. And then you sit down and we can talk about really how broad or narrow that patent is. Um, are there likely to be more like them? That's the type of discussion that we can have in, in engineering. Like, let's, let's pick this. That's one more question, sorry. So the, the question then is, you know, well, I do value patents, I do understand the value by pay mm -hmm. patents in a company. So as a startup company, then how, what's your guidance on how much patent budget we should put it onto the uh, button line item? Okay, so I do have a flat number, okay? So people ask me this question so often that um, they really need, to, they need an answer, and so I have one. But it is just kind of a ballpark estimate. And, and so what I say, it depends on how patent aggressive you're going to be. Sometimes a semiconductor electronics company is going to be much more aggressive than a company that's doing an app. All right? They, um, and I tell people in your first year of funding, post-funding, somewhere between thirty-five and fifty thousand dollars. And that's the type of number that most investors will go, okay, you've at least accounted for this, and they won't get, you know, they won't get freaked out. Um, Pre-funding, there's all kinds of options to minimize your costs and, and, and kind of bootstrap into it so you don't need to have $15,000 in your checking account the first day you have the time. Like you get a lot of advice on public disclosures or making sure assignments are done or you know, international filing. You can get you can get lunch with a patent attorney like for me, like like me, um, for the price of lunch. You know, we'll, 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 we'll do that. But, uh, and you can actually get a lot of information out of that about your situation. And that's a really good strategy in, in my book. If I were a startup founder again, I would, that's what I would do. I'd, I'd be taking the trees to lunch all the time, driving the time. But, but it only happens once. <laughs> um, so in your case, you know, that's kind of the number. Yeah. I'll sign up for lunch. Okay, sign up for lunch. I'll take it. Down south. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? I don't know. It's almost eight. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, Mario, we've gone about an hour. You want to keep going, or should we? Um, um, I'm you guys. I can talk about ask the trademarks audience. or ask that's the audience. How do you guys feel? Want to get one, one more, or what more questions? How do you guys feel? Yes. No, I question trademark. Yeah, trademarks. Uh, should you file one? I, I know it's not. 
it's one of those kind of gray area thing to do. Uh, um, terminologies, you know, in a company and, and things like that. So I do have startups to do trademarks very often. And it's usually a little after they've gotten traction. I mean, um, I don't see doing people doing trademarks pre-funding, for instance. And they'll do patent filings before they talk to investors. All right? And so um, one of the things that you can do is use a TM after the terms or words that you plan to use as a trademark. And then having talked to an IP attorney about really ha you have to be consistent on how you use that term. You have to use it really to identify a product or service. Um, you need to be consistent in it and not use it as an adjective. For can instance. you do that? Can you mark something uh, trademark TM superscript without having filed? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's also a difference internationally. So if you have a product and you're shipping it to Canada and you don't have a registered trademark in Canada, technically you should just have a little TM after it, not an R circle because your registration that you have is only in the United States. Most countries give you, um, if the first to use gets credit, there's a few exceptions like China, which is a strict first compile. Um, Spain used to be that way too. Um, but the, the, you know, the laws change, and you really need to sit down with, with an IP attorney to discuss those things. But, so trademarks can be inexpensive when there's money. We do it sometimes if it's an app. We do it internationally in software because in China specifically. Um, but really, generally, most people stick just with the United States. Um, you also have to have, have intent to use the mark. And within a certain time, actually start using it in commerce. And I have seen situations where that's a problem, like my client that does ice cream. Okay, they have stores up and down in, in Hayes Valley and, and up and down the peninsula here, but they don't do any interstate commerce. So their marks are, um, it, it took a little more effort to make sure that was used in interstate commerce. Yes. <laughs> the ice cream rate bill is. I used to be second. <laughs> We'll move on to the investment side. Yeah, sure. Right. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Welcome back to the Um Just quickly, let's walk through the investment side of this since that seems to be the most, uh, the part that people seem to have the most questions about. So these are the sources of funding for, for companies. I'm gonna go through a few of them. Uh, you'd be surprised how little early stage money actually comes from venture capital. So let's start with seed funding. So you started the company, you put a little bit of your own money into it to get it going, and now you need the first couple hundred thousand dollars uh, to a million dollars of seed funding to, to prove the concept, create a product, etc. So traditionally, um, so there's three ways we can do this, right? And for the longest time, we now have used convertible debt. So what that means is that, look, this company's really early. Um, we don't know what it's worth. It's so hard to value. It hasn't done anything yet. It hasn't, doesn't even have a product yet. So how are we going to value it? I'll tell you what we'll do, Mr. Investor. You make a loan to the company. That loan will convert into equity when we do our first uh, price round with an institution. And we'll give you a discount to that price, maybe 20%, because you got it early. And we'll even put a cap on the valuation so you know you're going to get a certain percentage of this company. And not only that, you get to piggyback off of the diligence of the institutional investor down the road. That's convertible debt. That's what we've done for years and years. Everybody does that. A couple of issues with that is number one, if it's debt, it means it has to be repaid. All right? And oftentimes, even, you know, oftentimes it, it did get repaid. The company got a year out, it did do its institutional round. Not had a debt instrument that came due, and I've been in situations where the investor then forecloses on the debt, ends up with the company, and that's not what anybody intended when they did this. They really intended it to be more equity-like. <clears throat> Secondly, debt has to pay interest. So you're the investor; you're getting interest income. You, you, you're not you're not doing this for interest return. You're taking equity risk. You want equity return. So it's kind of a hassle that it has to have this interest component. So enter the safe. All right. It's convertible equity, in effect. It's just like convertible debt that doesn't have to be repaid, uh, unless it says so, and it doesn't pay interest. It just sits there until the company does its first price round, that's preferred stock, and then it converts into that stock at that point. 
So you're delaying the valuation decision, and you're not worried about interest, you're not worried about default, no security interest floating around, nothing like that. That's very company favorable. Because you don't have to pay interest, and it's not debt, so they can't take your company away. Uh, but I'm seeing more and more and more of it. You know, everybody's getting comfortable with it. It's getting to be the way to go because it's so simple. Um, so I think of it as a warrant. I've been doing warrants for 20 years. It's nothing new. Uh, what's new is this uh, acronym SAFE. That's not even new anymore. Uh, and the fact that people are getting comfortable with it. And then finally, the price ground. That's when the company is far enough along that you've got an institution that people feel they can actually value. And everybody would, an investor would much rather have a price ground usually because they want to know what percentage of the company they're getting. And at some point, we will get to that. Um, so a couple of issues. Yes, sir. Do you have the new version of SafeNote, or is it typically YC? We all use the same one. YC company. Um, I've, I've, yeah, I've based, mine looks a lot like theirs. I've got a couple of little adjustments. Uh, it's different if it's an escort. It's different if it's an LLC. But it's it's like a two-page document. There's very little to it. That's kind of the benefit of it. The investors do a minimal due diligence, right? And they're and they're getting you know just a very basic deal. It's very risky, equity risk. And that brings me to securities laws that minimal due diligence part. Um, it's so easy these days to go online and just pull documents offline and start doing it yourself. And like I say, I see companies do this all the time um, because it's so easy and they're, they're engineers and they're smarter than me. That's why they're a client I'm not. So they just get their own documents and figure it out. Um, I got to tell you, if you mess it up, <laughs> you are selling a security. And I will introduce you to people that are sitting in prison right now that messed it up. And they were the most guileless people you'd ever want to meet. They didn't take the money and go to Bermuda with it. You know, they didn't have a fancy car or a girlfriend or anything like that. They spent it all on their company. They just screwed it up. And you don't believe it until you see it happen. Uh, but there are prosecutors that will go after uh, if it's egregious enough, if they mess it up badly enough. This is the kind of thing, and, and that's, you know, this is kind of the extreme example. It happens rarely. But the civil liability happens frequently, okay? And the civil liability comes because these startup companies, you know, we have this weird thing going on here in Silicon Valley when we sell securities. The representations that we make are just minimal. And the due diligence that the investors do is really not very much until you get into the bigger numbers. But that doesn't mean you don't have an obligation not to be misleading, right? You do have an obligation, and your documents might even impose a higher obligation. And if you don't disclose these material items, if you do say something that's misleading, then you may have violated the securities laws, you may be personally liable. So this is the one area where you really do need a lawyer. You really, and plus you've got state compliance. Now, I want to pause before we get to VC negotiations on that, because there's this thing called crowdfunding that's out there. Um, just be careful, right? There are good sites and good portals that have done a lot of deals, and there are people that don't know what they're doing. I'll just warn you, all right? So do your homework before you get on a crowdfunding site. It can be the greatest thing. You can be exactly what you need, uh, or it can be a one-way ticket to a lawsuit. VC negotiations, you know, sort of the holy grail in startup land. You want the big VC behind you. Um, I'll just say a, a couple of things I just want to go through. I'm going to give you one story that I like to tell. Uh, it was about three or four years ago, maybe longer, maybe four or five. Anyway, the, uh, the woman came to me, she's the founder of a company. She uh, discovered one day that the company she had founded 10 years earlier uh, was being sold for $500 million. She was the founder. And of course, she got kicked out by the VCs eventually, but she kept her stock. Augustine, five hundred million dollars, and she was getting zero out of that deal. Not only was she getting zero out of that deal, all of her friends and family that she brought into the deal that put their own money in that they didn't have much of, because they believed in her, they got zero. The Series A got zero. The Series B got zero. You had to get way into the alphabet before you found anybody who got anything. When we dug into it, it took a lot of digging. It's because the VCs did some inside rounds, 
And they had a very big multiple liquidation preference. And they had this anti-dilution protection. And it's a little complicated how it worked out. But believe me, it was totally orchestrated. Years earlier, years earlier, it, it was just so obvious when you read this that these VCs were just going to wash everybody out that came before them. Now, some of my, not of my best friends, some of my, not even good friends, I could tolerate some VCs, so I don't want to talk bad about them. But you got to know who you're doing business with, because these guys get a reputation. And some of them are very fair people, and some of them are going to take advantage of you if you let them. Now, the first thing I did when I saw these documents, and I went back to company counsel, big, big law firm, and I said, uh, you know that my client, the founder of this company, is getting zero in this deal. $500 million. He said, yeah, of course I know that. And you were company counsel when she entered into these documents. I said, that's right. He says, and you let her sign this without even telling her what this said. He said, yeah. I said, how do you justify that? And he says, she's not my client. The company's my client. You gotta be careful. You gotta be really careful when you're dealing, you know, with institutions. It's a much different level of sophistication. And sometimes you do need to lawyer up. I hate to say it. <clears throat> um, so, a couple of things, uh, anti-dilution protection, drags, that's where the VC has a right to force you to sell your shares if they find a buyer. Uh, they're going to want, you know, if you don't give up control in your first round usually, often you usually do in your second round, your B round, liquidation preference. You no, know, there's a, you know, there's a, what they call a participating and non-participating liquidation preference. You got to pay attention to the fine print. You know, it can make a big, big difference as to what they get in the back end. Um, you know, we could talk for a long time about that, but I'd rather, you know, I'd rather just take, if you have questions about VC financings, let me know, and, and we'll pause on it. You know, the one big question I always get is like, what about valuation? How do we discuss valuation? How do we bring it up? So here's the dance, okay? The first meeting, you should not talk valuation, right? And for God's sake, don't put that in your executive summary. You know, number one, it, it makes you look like a rube. And number two, Howard Hartbaum from August Capital told me this. He said, whatever number you put in a document you give me, I'm gonna cut it in half, okay? So don't do it, right? First meeting, you don't talk valuation. You talk team, you talk market, you excite people about what you're doing. All right, that's the wow, that's what Bill Rackard says. Second meeting, you might get to it. Now usually, the VC, they, they know how much of the company they want. They know how much money they want that you need. Poof, it's your valuation. You know, they know what it is. But every once in a while, I ask you, you know, to, to go negotiate something with them. Or to give them a, a, a number. Well, there are ways to do it. I've got about 30 of them. And if you guys email me afterwards, or if you let me know, I've got a big memo on all of the different valuation methods that people use in VC financings. And what I'll do, and, and just as a test, I'll find three that converge and come up to about the same number. I'll say that's probably what we're worth. So like I said, leave me a card, I'll send you my memo. Okay, this is the issue I just mentioned um, about who the client was. And then finally, I just want to say a few words about other financiers. So now we'll get back to crowdfunding. Um, private equity, we don't see so much, not in the startup world. Um, strategic investors, that's your sale. Um, crowdfunding, by the way, I'm seeing so much Chinese money right now. Just got to mention that. You know, that's, that's a source of funds. Uh, I had a deal recently where the investors, Chinese fund, these guys got off the plane on a Monday. They drove from the airport to my office. They said, can you introduce me to somebody? I gave them six companies. They met with all of them by Wednesday. They gave a term sheet to a couple of them by Friday, and they funded by the following Monday. It's that crazy, that market. So um, international investors is something everyone should think about. Crowdfunding. So we could talk for a long time about this. But there's really two kinds, really three kinds. There's accredited only, like AngelList. You go on a site, you're like an online VC, basically. Um, it's very safe. There's accredited where they advertise to the world and you verify that your investor, you ever know what accredited is? It used to mean a rich person, you know? <laughs> now it means somebody with a million dollars in net equity, exclusive of their house, 
or that earned two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollars jointly in the past three years per year. That's an accredited investor. If you do that, crowdfunding has opened up a whole world of billions of new dollars. It's really kind of solving that Series A crunch problem and replacing uh, a lot of the Series A funding. And now we got this relatively two uh, two new things. One is uh, fifty million dollar raises. I'm not going to talk about that. It's like a mini IPO. Uh, but there's this other thing, the Jobs Act. Um, I call it retail crowdfunding. There's a lot of different names for it, crowd financing, and it's where you can raise up to a million dollars on a platform, small amounts at a time from anybody, accredited or unaccredited, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. You can take small amounts, and this is something that is really starting to gain traction. Uh, the transaction costs are still relatively high because you have to have an attorney, you have to have a platform, you have to have an accountant to do a review or an audit of the statements, uh, you have to file a business plan or something like it with the SEC. So the transaction costs are relatively high, but a lot more and more companies are taking advantage of this now. Uh, and there are legitimate, and this is the place, there are sites out there that have actually done these deals, and there are sites out there that have not done these deals but want to test out their site on you. So be careful if you go that way. Because if you mess up, huh? is that a specific type of crowdfunding where you're talking about the million? Yeah. And they just passed the legislation on this, right? They, they passed it uh, th uh, four years ago. We just got implementing the SEC uh, finalized regulations just recently, allowing it. And uh, there's still a lot of problems. The big one is there's expanded liability if you get it wrong, you know, if you make a material misstatement. And there's a bill in Congress now called the Fix the Crowdfunding Act, you know, that's going to solve a lot of these problems. I'm a lawyer, so I'm risk averse, so I'm going to sit and wait until it gets fixed before I do one of these deals. But those deals are getting done. And if you're looking for money, you know, it's something to look into. Um, what is it called? Crowd crowdfinancing, the Jobs Act. The Jobs Act. Title III of the Jobs Act. Because Indiegogo and these guys do crowdfunding, but this is sort of a... This is different. This is crowd... Well, it, they might be doing equity crowdfunding now, but this is what I call crowdfinancing. Crowd you're selling equity on a platform. Okay, that's the that's the tricky part. Yeah, crowdfunding. And the idea was, you know, you can source the deal, right? People like to say, gee, you know, you had to be a VC to buy shares in Facebook. That's not fair. You know, they wouldn't let the little guy buy any shares. All right, that's all I have. Uh, we have a few questions. This is really a list of the companies that are doing the equity source crowdfunding. Uh, I'll send you some. Yeah. I'll Such thing that it exists. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, no, I just I just moderated a panel in LA last week with a company, um, Star Engine. And they're a very good, they're a very reputable site. They've done these deals, they've raised a lot of money, they have maybe hundreds on their site. Star Engine is a very good what about the old reverse mergers on a penny stock exchange? I, I I never, uh, uh, I've never. Can I tell you my story about reverse mergers? Okay, so the idea is you want to get liquidity, so you want to go public. So so you form a shell that has nothing in it, and you take the shell public. And you have minimal disclosure because it's just a shell. All you're going to tell the world is that we're going to go buy a company. So the transaction costs are really low. And they buy a company through this reverse merger. Um, where you you know shareholders of the shell end up with shares um, of the of the target company and poof you're public. Um, I've only had one of these deals about five years, uh, about ten years ago. The last time I looked into it, and a company came to me and I they had a reputable investment banker and I looked at it and the numbers just didn't add up and uh, and I kind of drove my feet so they went and found another law firm to do a big international national law firm that does nothing but these. And it just didn't add up to me, so I passed on it. And uh, three months later, six months later, the whole thing fell apart and everyone got sued, including the lawyers. So I never got near one of those ever again. <laughs> I wouldn't, I just wouldn't do it. The reason why is because the stock, it all went well, I shouldn't say it on tape, but there's a lot of risk in those deals because the stock might collapse after after the IPO and unhappy investors sue. I, I, I was one of those startups 
Oh, you were? That'd be really reverse IPO. How did it do? How did that go? You can sue me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, yes, sir. Thanks for the stupid question. So, there's so many law firms out there, and uh, how do you go out to pick the right law firm for you? I mean, whatever stage the company that we're at, I mean, any word of advice and, and how to do that? I know you're a representative. Yeah, exactly. but... Well, I'm biased, of course. <laughs> But um, keep in mind, uh, when, yeah, they're right. Lawyers are a dime a dozen. You know, there's one behind every tree, and there and there's plenty. First of all, it's local. If you're in Silicon Valley, you're going to find a lot of lawyers that can do the job, and they'll do it really well. And they know the market, they know the law, and they know all this stuff. Once you get out of Silicon Valley, it's a little bit of a gamble, and you can make one or two mistakes. You can hire your brother-in-law, who's the DA, you know, and is doing this as a favor, but has never incorporated a company before. That's a disaster waiting to happen. But equally as bad is you can hire that big Boston law firm that does big bond deals, and they're going to get it right, but they're going to charge you a couple hundred thousand dollars doing it because they're looking behind every tree as a over a billion dollar deal. You don't want either of those guys. You want startup lawyers, and Silicon Valley is full of them. Within the Silicon Valley, you can't really go wrong, but you might try to find somebody who's going to know your business, who's going to help you with a network, because that's the most important thing in this valley. Going to connect you with investors, with angels. By the way, every lawyer in town will connect you with the VCs. Every lawyer, if you want to see Sequoia, I will introduce you to Sequoia. They are not hiding. They're looking for you. They're looking for deals, right? That's not valuable. It's valuable is to find angels that are, yeah, and that's that's a much tougher thing. Not every lawyer in town is going to introduce you to angels because, first of all, we're putting our reputation on the line, so we have to believe in you, uh, and we have to understand you, and we have to know who is going to have a similar affinity for your company. So I think network is, is really important. I have, I have an input, Roger, I have input on that question. So. So in my entire, you know, I spent time as an engineer, as a marketing guy, as a part development, but in my entire legal career, I focused on startups. And the reason that I focus on startups is because I can make a big difference if there's three people and me, right, in the room and we're making decisions. I, I would never, I've only temporarily worked for large companies when they bought my clients. And I think that the, the, the attorneys like Roger or myself in the, in the Valley that specialize in startups, we specialize in people, right? We build relationships with those people. And in my firm, and um, in many firms, you're gonna meet a partner and you're gonna be handed off to a supervisor who has four or five associates under them. And one of those associates might do your work. And you'll actually go into, I've been in, in, in meetings where there's five or six attorneys, right? We're meeting with a startup team, and I call it gang building, all right? It, it, it's, and I, 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 I've been the associate, and I'm sitting at the table going, oh my God, this is a $1,500 an hour meeting, and, and two of us are the only ones that are necessary. I like working startups because I really like to get to know the people and be part of the team, and I have, clients that invite me over to their kids' birthday parties. I mean, so get to know the people that meet a bunch of attorneys and then get ones that have a, are willing to have a personal relationship with them. It gets harder, the bigger the firm, right? So I have a lot fewer people to worry about than Roger does, right? Because I, just, I work on the IP side and he works, he does everything. But you need, the best thing you can do is, is build relationships with people and eventually